After all, what's more fundamental to a person's well-being than a roof over their head? We're still working and we're still making progress, but we don't see the finish line. It's not acceptable, but in a competitive environment, in government, we just can't pick and choose which projects we like. So they have to compete. Right now, we have a competitive process, and sometimes they don't get funded. There's still this awful process that takes years and years to get anything approved, and where we allow any neighbor to say, sorry, this doesn't belong here. In those 40 bedrooms, there could be as many as 80 people. And if even 20 of them have cars, it will be a nightmare for this neighborhood. One of the guys that I work with currently, um, he commutes from Tracy, and he says that he starts his shift at 6.30, but he leaves his house at 3. We do not want to put the lives of our citizens at risk through what I would call ill-advised, multi-unit, high-density units. One of the reasons this BART station is yes. so successful is that people can drive here and park. All of that parking is going to be gone, and they're making an assumption that the people moving in will not have cars. I think it's really scary. Stand up for your property rights before they get taken away. They want to take away your decision of where you're going to live and how you're going to live. We live here in this in this community just like they do. We, and while we respect their position, we, we'd like them to hear our side of it. We're really clear about the demands that, we, that we're making. We want 100% affordable housing. There's no one out there right now that can do it with the cost of construction uh, and materials. There's just no way, you know, and so that's why we're here tonight talking about 31% affordable. We want to be a city that includes Latinos, includes African Americans, that includes seniors, that includes people uh, who have limited income. We do not want to be a city that is just overtaken by the highest bidder, but that is what the city is becoming. Hi, I'm Greg Dalton, host of Climate One. There's a lot in that video. We wanted to share that with you to get some of those voices here in the room to ground that conversation. I certainly heard some uh, not so coded language there from Hillsborough about exclusion and the person from Tracy driving from th three to 6.30. Thank you all for joining us in the room here at the Commonwealth Club uh, for this conversation on housing as a climate lever. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area for our live stream audience. I would like to acknowledge the Ohlone and Coast Miwok people who, and other indigenous people who've inhabited these lands for more than 10,000 years. I recently started talking and getting to know members of the Coast Miwok in Moran and, and elsewhere and it, have learned a lot. I encourage you to connect with indigenous people in your community, wherever you are. Uh, they are still here. We're recording today's conversation for the Climate One radio show and podcast. It drops every Friday. You can subscribe wherever you get your pods. This evening's event will be in two parts. First, I'm going to sit down one-on-one -on -one with a real leader on housing in California, State Senator Scott Wiener. And then we're going to have a second conversation with Ben Bartlett, the Vice Mayor of Berkeley, and Jennifer Hernandez, a land use and environmental attorney. At the end of each section, we're going to have your questions here from the audience in the room in San Francisco. Please write your name and your question on the cards on your seat. Helps if you make it legible and concise. And our producer, Megan, will collect those and then we'll invite you to come up to the microphone in the order called to ask your own question. So that's how we're going to do it. For those of you on the live stream, please write your questions in the comments section. We'll try to get to those as well. And now, please welcome State Senator Scott Wiener. Senator, thanks for, thanks for joining us. I think it's fair to say when people think of housing and climate, they might think about these days uh, heat pumps or perhaps some methane cooktops and induction cook stoves. Uh, but how is housing, new housing construction a climate issue? Um, thank you for having me. I mean, of course, we want our, our, all of our buildings, and particularly new ones, to be decarbonized and, and to have a lower carbon footprint in and of themselves. It's very important. But even more important uh, is having housing that's located in a place where people don't have to drive everywhere, commute long hours, uh, where people can drive less or, if they choose, not drive at all, uh, have access to public transportation, be close to where they go to school, where they work go to the gym um, and so forth. 
Uh, that's how we really, really uh, reduce our carbon footprint because transportation is a massive aspect of, of, of carbon emissions. In California, it's almost half. Uh, and so if we're serious about reducing carbon emissions, uh, we, we, we gotta have a more sustainable land use pattern in terms of where we're putting housing. Right, and, if, and most of the curves in California on climate are going in a, a positive direction down if they're bad things, and vehicle traveled is the one thing that's, that's getting away from California. Absolutely, we're, 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 not, we're not doing enough, first of all, to support public transportation, but we, because we make it so hard to get housing approved in the places where we want it, in infill housing, near jobs, near transit, in existing communities, we make it so hard and expensive and a fight, as we, as we just heard. Um, it, the, the easiest place to put housing is where there are no neighbors, or very few, which means sprawl, which means destroying open space, destroying sensitive habitat, building in wildfire zones, building further and further and further out where there are fewer people to complain about the housing, and that is very destructive environmentally. I recently drove from San Francisco to Yosemite and just was like hours and hours of still these bedroom communities just like reaching out into the Sierra foothills. Two thirds of residential land in California had been restricted to single family homes that have been off limits to the development of backyard houses. A law you authored changed that, yet it hasn't opened up a whole lot of new supplies. Why is it so hard to build affordable housing in the world's fifth largest economy? Well, in terms of zoning, you're right, the, the large majority of land in California was zoned only for single family homes. And what that means, just to put it in totally plain English, means every other kind of housing was banned. It didn't used to be that way uh, until like 50 years ago, you could build apartment buildings in a lot of different places. And then starting in the 70s into the 80s, uh, cities methodically banned apartment buildings and said only single family homes. So only one unit of housing per parcel which creates a math problem. Uh, and it also completely induced sprawl. And people knew at the time. And racial was, filtering, yes. let's be honest. And, 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 and single family zoning was invented about 100 years ago after the Supreme Court struck down racial zoning. Uh, communities, starting with Berkeley, uh, discovered, well, if we, we, we can't explicitly uh, ban people of color. But what we can do is make it impossible uh, for anyone who's not uh, you know, upper income to live here. And so they said you can only build single family homes. So we, we did pass, well first we uh, really strengthened our existing law to allow for in-law units or a, what we call an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and that, it took a while, but that's now exploding. We're seeing a, 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 up and down the state, it, these accessory units are, are being built in increasing numbers. Uh, if, um, a couple of years ago, we passed legislation led by our Senate president, Senator Tony Atkins from San Diego, um, to basically eliminate single family zoning uh, and to have duplex zoning or, or two to four units. Um, it's only been in effect for a year. Um, it, you know, development never moves as fast as we want, so people are worrying that it's not pr uh, producing enough, but it'll, it'll get there, it just takes time. Okay, so granny units or in-law units will, will get there, yet when it's still cheaper to build outside of cities, further from jobs and amenities, how do you address climate and the justice and equity issues at the same time? Yeah, well, we, we need to make it uh, easier and easier uh, to build in sustainable locations, and infill housing in, in existing communities, near jobs, near schools, near public transportation, uh, and that's what we're trying to do, um, to try to, because right now we've set up a system that's designed to fail, um, a system that empowers, it's, I, I, I'm a former local elected official, I'm a former neighborhood association president, um, I believe in public input and people having a stake in their own community and, and having the right to have an opinion about their own community, uh, but we've gone so far beyond that that we have endless process that can take years and years and years, even if you're building within all the rules uh, uh, in addition, we have empowered obstructionists mm -hmm. who are not typically r representative, right? Most people don't even know that this public hearing is happening. They're, they're working, they're trying to get their kids to do their homework, they're putting dinner on the table, uh, and you have people who may or may not be representative of the community at large, but they have the ability 
to show up at a million community meetings and to file appeals and 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 they are able we, we've given them the tools to obstruct delay kill these projects and that needs to change has that changed during zoom because zoom with a lot of things commission meetings online people can just kind of click on rather than go downtown and spend a whole evening i attended a, a, a zoning commission meeting on zoom i never would go downtown to yeah. to do that did that happen i i, I don't think i don't think i mean I, I left local government by the time mm -hmm. zoom came around for public comment uh but uh I, I do remember my time on the board of supervisors from 2011 to 2016 we would have some hearings when it was all in person that would go on for eight or 10 hours. So people were very capable of physically coming down to testify. Um, and, and so it, then and now there's a lot of participation. And again, participation is good as long as there is a beginning, middle and end of the process and understanding that not everyone's going to get their way and that the system should not be designed that anyone can constantly relitigate everything, but that we hear people out and then we come to a decision and we move forward in a timely way. Because some people say that you know, housing is an example where NIMBYs and progressive areas have captured regulators, something that liberals often accuse uh, people on the right and corporations of doing, but NIMBYism is, is sort of regulatory capture from the left, so, so what's the solution? Well, first of all, I don't think NIMBYism is left. Uh, true progressivism is not NIMBYism. And so I think you have people in the blue areas, um, like parts of California and other parts of the country, who have, they, they might have a Bernie Sanders sign on their lawn or a Black Lives Matter sign on their lawn or a big rainbow flag unfurled, which is great, uh, but they are at the same time acting in a very, very conservative way by saying, I don't want any change in my community. And I, I'm worried about the, the quote unquote kind of people who are gonna come here, who are gonna somehow quote unquote degrade my community. Mm -hmm. If showing up at a planning commission or a city council um, like development appeal in a blue area, is sometimes it doesn't sound that different from a red area in terms of the things that come out of people's mouths uh, and things that it's shocking to hear people say. And I get it, people are very passionate about their neighborhood. I completely respect that. Uh, but sometimes we need to be forward thinking and saying, hey, this might, maybe it'll be a little bit harder for me to park. Maybe there'll be a view that, is, that I've had for a long time that, I, that, that isn't quite as good anymore. But more people are gonna be able to live here, that there will be a, a prayer for, for the next generation to ha have a place to live. Maybe fewer people will be living in their cars. Maybe we won't have 5% uh, of San Francisco Unified School District. 5% of those kids are homeless. Mm. And that's consistent and probably an undercount statewide, that we have families who are literally waking up in a homeless shelter or a car, dropping their kids off from school, going to work. And so that's what this is about. And so I think NIMBYism is inherently very conservative, even if you're registered as a Democrat. Right. Well, I've spent part time in Marin County. There's no place that's sort of more progressive and yet more conservative and, and racially exclusive than Marin, north of San Francisco. California has a statewide goal of reaching two and a half million new housing units by 2030, one million of which was, must be affordable. New housing construction has fallen behind demand for decades, and for decades, cities and counties have not met their goals and not much has happened. Now those jurisdictions face financial penalties for not meeting state mandated levels of new housing. Will the hammer get the job done? I think it will move us in a, a very good direction. And when we see what's ha happening in the last six or eight years where we've really been putting teeth into longstanding state housing law in California uh, and passing new laws. And, and it has, uh, I think it's gradually working. And we look at in San Francisco, the Board of Supervisors just adopted what we call a housing element. Um, uh, and a housing element in California is every eight years, a city has to put together a housing plan, um, incorporating like numbers of new homes that the state provides. Uh, and you have to plan for how you're going to meet 
that those housing goals in the next eight years. And historically, the process has been a, sort of a joke. Um, I went through it when I was on the Board of Supervisors. It was very controversial, but ultimately, it's like a document that sits on a shelf collecting dust. The housing element process now it has teeth in it. Uh, and San Francisco just ado adopted uh, a new housing element to plan for 82,000 homes. It's a very, very strong plan. I want to commend our planning department and the Board of Supervisors and the mayor and everyone who made this happen. But that happened because the people in our city government who want to do the right thing now had the leverage to do it because the hammer of state law was out there, that if the city adopted a bad housing plan or didn't adopt one on time, there would be all sorts of consequences. And, and cities up and down the state are seeing that, and, are, and a lot of them are trying to do the right things, and the ones that don't do the right thing are going to have consequences. And so that's two to three times the amount of you know, annual production that San Francisco and Bay Area... Three times. Yeah, three, three times. Yeah. Um, so is that going to make the NIMBYs not be NIMBYs? No. They, what we fa what we found is that even when you, you even when you streamline housing approvals and if, if there are cities that want to fight it, they'll try to find loopholes. With uh, with in law units for years, it, cities were technically required to allow people to put in law units in their homes. Uh, cities ignored it. They found all sorts of loopholes. We eventually it took us like five or six laws that we passed. We finally I think sealed off every loophole, and now it, it's just sort of happening. And unfortunately, you ha the, the and there are certain cities that have showed us the way. Like they've been so obstructionist that they unearth every loophole, which I really appreciate because then we can go in. If and anyone do hears from Woodside, we're yeah. talking about yeah. you. Yeah. Who, who, <laughs> Actually, Cooper, Cupertino did a great job of that, where Apple is headquartered. They unearthed every loophole, and so we would close the loopholes based on what they discovered. Um, and they now have a new city council that's a lot better, so that's a good thing. Transit-oriented development has been talked about for a long time, uh, aims to build housing near transportation hubs. I recently drove around uh, near the BART station in Concord, a city of 130,000 people, 30 miles from San Francisco. There were empty lots near the, the regional BART uh, commuter rail station, also blocks of housing, four to five stories tall. It's like, okay, I can see kind of things happening here. Uh, yet building on parking lots near that commuter rail is highly controversial. Some say high housing is a higher use of that land and others say revoke removing parking hurts working class people who can't afford to live close by because housing prices are so high so how do you balance that yeah i mean if you think about it when, when you look at it, like the bart system in the bay area we have all these bart stations where we make public investments and very few people live within walking distance. It's people who live in single family homes who are privileged to have been able to afford those homes right by the BART station. And so the idea is to also allow for apartment buildings, particularly, you know, BART has a lot of land around the station to put apartment buildings there. And we actually, um, a, a few years ago, we passed a law authorizing BART to approve its own uh, projects within certain constraints. It was very controversial. We felt, felt that it was important because some of the cities that have BART stations were just refusing uh, to allow it. Um, we want to make sure that there's mixed income. These are mixed income developments. That it's, it's either some will be 100% affordable or mixed income with market rate um, and um, and below market rate mixed together, which is great to have mixed income developments. We want to make sure that that people of all incomes can live there. Uh, there there's also nothing that would stop. Bar, instead of having, if you think about it, these, park, these massive parking lots, that surface parking lots, if you replace that, most of it for housing, you can still have, they can create a parking structure um, if they want. There's nothing stopping them from doing that so that people who are, you know, still have the ability to, to drive in if they don't live anywhere nearby. So there's nothing stopping BART from having that kind of mixed use. Right. One of the best transit agencies in the world is the Hong Kong Metro, and it is basically a property development enterprise where they think about that. Yeah, it's it's, it's rail, but it's also the property that hands around it. It seems like we, we've we separated that here when, when BART was built. Uh, when you were last here on this stage at Climate One, you talked about seeing waves of people forced out of your own neighborhood. You also said that new housing construction in Washington, D.C. and New York had reduced rents in those cities, yet lower rents and displacement can happen at the same time. Rents can soften and people can still be displaced. So what needs to be done to ensure that new development doesn't increase displacement? Yeah, I think that the, we have to be very clear that the, co the cause of displacement is not having enough homes. 
when you have a shortage of homes, there's competition, the prices go up, and we know what happens, and we know who tends to be the winners and who tends to be the losers. And lower income, working class people tend to draw the short end of the straw when you have a shortage of homes. Uh, and so, for example, we, we about uh, nine years ago, we had a big fight about whether to have a moratorium on new housing in the mission. And there were um, advocates in the mission who were pushing for that because they were very concerned that new construction was going to push out. I was going to say this is a historically Hispanic part of San Francisco. Yeah. And what they pointed to uh, cor correctly was that over the last ten, the prior 10 or 15 years, something like 8,000 Latino families had left the mission. And while some of those families no doubt left because they went and maybe got, bought a home in the Excelsior or went to Delhi City, there were clearly a significant number of Latino families that had, had been pushed out of the mission. But if you look at housing construction over that same, I forget, 10 or 15 year time period, almost no new housing had been built in the mission. If you ranked San Francisco neighborhoods for that time period, uh, the mission was very close to the bottom in housing production. That's changed over the last decade. But at that time, we were seeing massive displacement in the mission with almost new, no new housing being built. And that is because the mission is an amazing neighborhood. It is central, it's great weather, it has good transit, it is a beautiful, wonderful neighborhood. And a lot of people wanted to live there and that jacked up the rents and it gave landlords incentives to, to, to evict people and, and, and all that. And so that having a shortage of housing is the core driver of displacement. You can have a bad situation where you allow for new housing, where you're demolishing old housing and displacing people. And that's why new development needs to be accompanied by anti-displacement strategies, like not knocking down uh, sound, you know, uh, apartment buildings where people are living to, just to replace it. And in the narrow circumstances where it does make sense to replace a building, taking care of the people who are there by giving them temporary housing and then bringing them back, paying the same rent, which we've done in some developments. We need strong renter protection so people aren't evicted. So if, you're, if you combine anti-displacement strategies with adding new housing, you're not going to see that kind of displacement. You will reduce the pressure because you have all these new buildings that people can live in without having to try to displace people in other uh, older buildings. So there's often a formula that, that, that new construction has to be, what, 30% uh, affordable? Is, is that enough? Uh, well, um, we, first of all, you, you need projects to be able to pencil out. So we have publicly funded projects that are 100, typically 100% affordable, where, where, where we use tax credits and bond financing and so forth. Uh, when you're talking about private development, San Francisco's inclusionary, the required affordability is like 20 or so, 21%. Um, and, you know, different kinds of projects pencil in different ways. So there are some smaller projects where 21% may not be feasible uh, for that project. Larger projects, especially projects that also maybe include, you know, office or other um, economic drivers can probably support a higher percentage of affordability. And so um, it, we want to make sure we have these mixed income projects, but we also need to make sure that they pencil out financially because you can have... You can say we, we want 30 or 40 or 50 percent affordability, but if the project doesn't pencil out, you know, 50 percent of zero is still zero. Right. It still has to attract capital to 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 do that project because even the state doesn't have enough money to yeah. to build build all of this. Yet we're still talking about what million dollars a door. I mean, is it really ever going to really you know make build enough housing when it's so bloody expensive in this? Yeah. Area? It, cost, uh, the cost of construction is, is off the charts. And it's higher in San Francisco than elsewhere. It's going to be higher. I mean, it's more expensive to do anything in a place like San Francisco or New York City or in these you know, big cities. But it's way, way, way too expensive. And, uh, and how, some, do we, how do we get it down? Well, the, the process cost adds to that. If it, if it takes three, four, five, seven years to get something approved instead of like three to six months, which some of the, the laws that we've been able to pass that streamline permits say that if you, that you have to, the city has to give the permit within three to six months, depending on the size of the project. So three to six, so for example, I'll tell you, Bridge Housing, which is the largest nonprofit affordable housing builder in California, told us that after a particular law that I authored was signed into law, SB 35, once that happened, their average time to get a permit to build dropped from an, an average of seven years 
to an average of four months. Wow. And so when you think about it, if, if you have a project that goes on and on, that, that it's just dragging on and appeals and lawsuits and endless process, you think about all the architects and the lawyers and the consultants and everything, that is very expensive and adds to the cost. Um, we, are, uh, we, we, we have a, a, a construction workforce shortage in California. That drives up the cost. We want to make sure we need to train more construction workers. Uh, we, we have much less control over the cost of materials, and we know that construction materials have gone up in the last uh, few years, but it is way too expensive, and, and, and it is a problem. Right, and this, we're sitting in the city of the million dollar donated toilet. Um, so prior to the pandemic, office vacancy rates in San Francisco was about 4%. Today it's around 26. Nationally, that number is about 12%. Uh, can, cities in, can cities in California around the country convert some of those empty offices to residential? So we, first, last year we, we passed legislation by my, my, my counterpart, um, I'm the I chair of the Senate Housing Committee. My the chair of the Assembly Housing Committee is uh, Buffy Wicks from the East Bay, and she uh, led on a piece of on a new law that le that facilitates commercial conversion. And that typically is going to be you know strip malls or office parks or sort of low rise. Um, when, when we when we talk about downtown San Francisco, um, converting high rises to housing it, it is very hard. And it may, and it, it could be very cost prohibitive because if you think about how the the plumbing, for example, hap it's 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 very centralized, right? One bathroom per floor. It's not per unit. So you have to completely, you know, re restructure the whole building. Yeah. It could work for some high rises, but for many, it won't. It won't be feasible. I, I also just want to say, and this is just in defense of of the great city of San Francisco, our, our obituary has been written a million times. You can go back to the, to the 80s and they were, they were writing San Francisco's obituary. The city was on death's door. And, and part of it is that people are infatuated with San Francisco and I, I will say jealous of our great city. And so people like almost have schadenfreude that San Francisco might actually be dying. And every time we come back stronger than before, downtown, downtown is, is obviously going through challenging times. Um, it, is, it is more vibrant now than it was six or nine months ago. Uh, the Trans owners of the Transamerica Pyramid are making a massive investment uh, in that building. Uh, and I, I think downtown San Francisco will come back. Uh, and what I don't want to see is cannibalizing our office stock and, and then all of a sudden we're back where we were in 2019 where we had a, a massive shortage of offices and small businesses and nonprofits and law firms, et cetera, were getting pushed out of the city because there was no office space they could afford. So I want us to take the long view. I don't think anyone knows what office is gonna look like in three years. Anyone who says they does, I, I think they're, uh, they're, they're speculating. Uh, so I think we need to be very thoughtful about how we approach that. Sounds like you're ready to stand up for San Francisco values and maybe uh, yes. succeed the face of San Francisco values in the house perhaps one day. Um, so in, environmental regulations like California Environmental Quality Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, often used to slow down, they've been, they've been weaponized. Um, should they be reformed or relaxed in some way? Um, uh, yeah, massively. Um, the, the, the California, California Environmental Quality Act is, I, I, refer to, I refer to it as the law that swallowed California. Um, this was a law that was created in the 1970s for excellent reasons. And I, I'm not one to say CEQA should be uh, repealed. CEQA needs to be refocused on actually protecting the environment and CEQA needs to be turned into a climate action law, which right now it is not. Um, the purpose of CEQA was when you're doing something that could be potentially environmentally destructive, building a highway, building a, a dam, doing something that could be really harmful environmentally, that you have to analyze the environmental impacts to inform the decision maker. That's a great idea. Uh, CEQA was never intended to allow your neighbor to jack you up because you're trying to replace your windows. And right now, you can do that. Or, or stop a, bu a bike lane. Stop a bike lane, stop a bus rapid transit lane, stop an apartment building on top of a public transport, on top of a rail station. That's what CEQA, some of the things that CEQA is being used for. And that, that or, or to stop UC Berkeley from admitting students 
That's what a, 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 a court decision ruled last year before the legislature overruled the court and changed the law. And so when you look at some of the things that, or to stop solar, that, that, that's used for that too. And so that, that, that is a problem. CEQA turned in from a, in converted from an environmental law to a process law. And I'm not saying there are times when CEQA can be used to stop really bad projects, but there are a lot of good projects that either get killed or delayed um, and become more expensive or get chopped in half. Uh, and it, and, and it, anyone who can hire a lawyer, you can be a CEQA player. And you, can, and you can delay and stop projects, and that is government at its absolute worst. It's not democratic. Again, CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, what housing and city models do you look at elsewhere? Who's getting it right? You're an expert on housing here in California. Look around the country. What do you see that's real bright spot? Well, I, th I think there, there are cities that their rents, this is, and this is pre-pandemic, the pandemic scrambled things up a bit, um, that were, built a lot of housing and rents came down. Like Washington, D.C. was one. Chicago was another. Uh, I'm not saying they have perfect systems, but they're, it, it, it show, and these are great, amazing cities. Uh, I, I'm a believer in, in social housing, um, which we used to call public housing, publicly built and, and run uh, housing, uh, typically mi mixed income. Uh, and, and we used to do that. Ronald Reagan killed it off in the 80s, which is, by the way, when when homelessness started to skyrocket, that was not a coincidence. He also closed mental health facilities. Right, but but most most but since most homeless people do not have mental health issues, you we t took away this sort of safety net um, housing. Mm -hmm. So you, ha housing that and then let what we had fall apart. Um, but when you look in San Francisco, we've rebuilt some of that housing into some beautiful mixed income communities like Valencia Gardens and the Mission. Um, we're doing it in the south, our southeastern neighborhoods, and, and we, we need to get back to significant public investment in social housing. So we, you know, we, a group of us went to Vienna uh, last September, uh, and they have an amazing social housing system, but other European cities do as well, as well as Singapore, um, and it's a really great model. It's not, it, sh it doesn't have to be the entire housing system. It's not about taking people's homes away, but it should be there as a bedrock uh, to really just to make sure that everyone has a home and can afford a home. That should, not, should never be a question in a society about whether someone has the ability to have a home. Having a home should never be a privilege. It should be a right, uh, and, but it can only be a right if we have enough homes for everyone who needs them. Even Hong Kong, one of the most capitalistic places on the planet, has a lot of public or social housing. This is clearly an engaging conversation with many more audience questions than we have time for. But I'd like to call on Jason and uh, Apurv to the mic. Uh, and in the meantime, Marcus on our live stream asks, please talk about limiting the growth of housing, not expanding it. For how long can the California ecosystem continue to support population growth? I, you know, I don't, I don't agree that building new housing is what drives population growth. People move where they want to live. But the lack of it can drive people out of state. It, 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 well, it can, but, but let's, let's be clear. We stopped building housing in a meaningful way decades ago, and our population for decades continued to grow. And what that meant was we had more homelessness, we had more overcrowding uh, in homes. Uh, and so, it, you know, I, I just don't agree that if we stop if we stop building housing, it's going to just people are going to stop coming here. They're going to still come here, and we, even though we have in the last few years, California's population growth has plateaued and then t shrunk by a tiny amount. I don't know that that's going to continue. And also with with climate migration, with a lot of the Southwest, this Mediterranean climate is going to be a lot more appealing when people there's no water uh, in the Southwest. Let's go to uh, Jason. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so my question is, obviously, eliminating restrictive zoning is vital to multifamily development, but it seems like the high cost of labor, materials, and borrowing money are also major impediments. I was wondering what ideas the state government is evaluating to alleviate some of those cost burdens that are facing developers right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the one that we have the most control over is the process, um, as I mentioned a little while ago, that we... Um, you know, making it really fast and, and cost-effective to actually get a permit. 
uh, to build housing, and that's not going to solve all the cost issues, but that is a significant um, cost that we can that we have within our power to to reduce or to reduce dramatically. Um, we need we need a much we have bigger construction workforce. Um, we've had a boom bust construction workforce where you know, during the 07, 08 Great Recession, the construction industry basically liquidated and, and construction workers went to do other things. Um, we need to find a way that when we have a, a downturn in the private sector that we increase public investment in housing to keep all of those construction workers working so that they're when, so when we go into an up cycle again, they're they're there and available, uh, because the lack of a construction workforce has also been um, a cost driver. Uh, I you know on financing I we have less of, a, of an impact on, uh, but, but we do need more public investment overall. Thank you, Ap Apurv. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your, all your leadership on housing, Senator. Um, how can we break the chicken and egg problem of building dense infill housing and transit when the cost of per mile building transit is like skyrocketing? Similar to how you've authored all these laws to remove process for housing, uh, is there any laws or ideas you have in mind to remove the cost of process for building transit as well? Absolutely, and in fact, I um, I authored a law that what went into effect in 2021, and then we just reauthorized it. So now it's extended um, to uh, uh, streamline the approval process for um, light rail, uh, bus rapid bus lanes, uh, bike lanes, and pedestrian safety projects. So, for example, uh, in San Francisco, when we built um, the Van Ness bus rapid transit line, I don't know if you wrote it at all. It, it's a major, it's a bus only lane going up Van Ness, which is one of the major thoroughfares in San Francisco. Uh, it used to be I, I would avoid taking that bus because it would just get stuck in traffic jams the entire way. You could sometimes walk faster. They, they now have their own lane. It is so fast to get up Van Ness. It's transformational. It took ten years to get that project approved um, uh, under the law that we passed. That will not happen again. Um, and then it took way too long for it to get designed and built. Um, so we're trying and we're making some progress, but we, app we need to get these projects done fast. When I, we took a trip to Mexico City to look at their uh, rapid bus lines. From the idea to cutting the ribbon and opening it, it would take three years in Mexico City. I would like to see that happen here as our outer limit as well. Well, uh, we're, we're getting close here to the end, but you have a lot of leadership in, in California on housing and other climate issues. You introduced a bill recently that's, that's not really housing, but I want to ask you about it as we close here, which is to have companies doing business in the state disclose the emissions in their supply chain. California is the fifth largest global economy. A lot of what comes out of uh, Hollywood and Silicon Valley ripples around the world. So what do you hope to achieve with that law? Yeah, we're about to be four. We're going to leapfrog over Germany, apparently, in the very near future. Um, so, uh, so tr transportation is a big part of our, our carbon footprint. Um, uh, corporate emissions are also a significant part. And there are uh, large corporations that are working very hard to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, and there are other corporations, many of them, that are not necessarily. And, and then others that are, and it's galling, they're not really doing a great job reducing their emissions, but they market themselves as green. And so it's called greenwashing, and it's bad. Um, and so what our uh, bill, it was a bill we did last year that failed, passed the Senate, failed by one vote on the assembly floor. Where we just reintroduced it, um, it's Senate Bill 253. Uh, and what it does is it requires large corporations to disclose um, their entire carbon footprint, including from their supply chain, which is usually the bulk of emissions. Um, and it, we're, and that, that kind of transparency will create a big incentive to actually walk the walk, because it's going to be embarrassing for some corporations who have been marketing themselves as green when it turns out that they're not. Um, so this is an idea. There, there are large corporations that already do this, Walmart, PepsiCo, Patagonia, um, a number of other ones. Even some ones that are not viewed as progressive companies are already doing this. There's an established methodology. Uh, this bill will require any public or private corporation with revenue of a billion or, or more a year to dis make that annual disclosure if they're doing business in California, which is basically all of them. 
Um, and so it'll, uh, the Biden administration is trying to do this at the federal level, and it is unfortunately not going well. Um, so we're going to do it here in California and lead the way. There's a big backlash from the right against Wall Street. Yeah, figure that one out. But um, we've been discussing housing as a climate lever with State Senator Scott Weiner. Thank you, Senator, for coming here and for your leadership on so many climate issues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to have a quick uh, set change here. And as uh, you know, we're going to going a. Um, generational change in California political leadership with Senator Feinstein, Senator Pelosi, you may see certainly more of Senator Weiner in the future in that context. Fabulous. Um, excellent. Now please welcome Jennifer Hernandez and uh, Ben up here. Ben Bartlett, please come on up. Yep. <laughs> Excellent. So now we're going to have um, our second part of our conversation today. Um, ben Bartlett is uh, vice mayor of Berkeley, and Jennifer Hernandez is a land use and uh, environmental attorney um, who does a lot with uh, a lot, lot on housing. So I'd like to, to begin, um, Ben, with you. Uh, your family has lived in Berkeley since the 1800s. And you originally got involved in local politics and made housing your issue when your mother was evicted. What was your reaction when that happened and how does that inform the work you do today? Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me here tonight. Really happy to be here and see everyone. Um, yeah, so I was living my life as a, a normal young person in Berkeley, uh, having fun. And then all of a sudden, uh, my mother and her friends lived in a house with a bunch of seniors, retired school teachers, they were all uh, victimized by their landlord who was uh, uh, prepping the building for development. And so they turned the water off, the heat off. It was um, a very intense situation of economic eviction. Uh, they damaged their cars. All these are read about, all the horror stories. And when they, when they left, I was like, okay, well, we'll just have them go to, go to senior housing. And then I saw there was no senior housing. The wait list for senior housing, I was told, was 14 to 17 years. And I didn't quite understand. I was like, wait, this is America, right? These are taxpayers. They've, put in their they've done their duty, and now there's nowhere for them to go. So at that moment, I realized that the, there, there was a thing called a housing crisis, and there's also an economic crisis and a crisis of disrespect uh, of our people. So I decided to get involved and address some of these issues. We'll get into that, what you're doing a little more. Jennifer, your father, and I believe both of your grandfathers were steel workers in Pittsburgh, California, where you grew up. How did your upbringing shape your understanding of the relationship between jobs and housing? Sure, so uh, we had uh, father, grandfathers, everybody in town mostly had good union jobs. And one of the things that that came with in America was the opportunity to buy a small home. And that small home became uh, a piggy bank because every month paying even a modest amount of mortgage uh, was paying in part to your own family's equity. And the housing crisis really hit first for both grandmothers who spent each almost 20 years as widows uh, with no income. Uh, and then for my dad who was laid off permanently from his job in, uh, at age 56. Um, it was the fact that they owned their house outright that allowed my sister to stay in college, my younger sister, uh, and ultimately has provided for their old age. Um, that's the American dream. Home ownership was affordable in Pittsburgh. Our family could have never afforded to live in Berkeley. There are different levels of affordability. And for me, housing is very much about respecting and all of the above and all of us strategy and all of us isn't necessarily going to entice a construction worker which we need more of to be content living in someone else's backyard cottage we still need places like pittsburgh and pittsburgh now has bart and it was always kind of a little bit crazy to have the whole world wake up at seven or six in the morning and go in one direction and then come back eight hours later. That was always a little crazy. <laughs> COVID's breaking us, broken us from that crazy pattern and we're reinventing work and reinventing 
remote work and rediscovering the joys of having a little bit more room than a baby, two people in a one bedroom home in the mission. So for me, housing is an all of the above strategy and any effort to make one size fits all leaves out people who are unlikely to be in this audience, like my dad and my grandparents and my brother and my nephew who are still in the trades. So it's time to be respectful and that's respectful of both economic and color lines. And well, that's why I'm, ha I'm very passionate about housing. Well, with what, two million units needed to be built in California, we need to build everywhere. That two million is not gonna happen in any one particular place. Ben, uh, Berkeley was one of the first cities to implement single family zoning shortly after the US Supreme Court struck down racial zoning as unconstitutional. They just rebranded it. Uh, now Berkeley's housing element or housing plan commits the famously liberal city <laughs> to address its historic underinvestment in communities of color. Will that really happen? Uh, yes. It will. <laughs> and it's important to realize too, housing is the fulcrum of the, of the economic health of a society because you can live in high resource areas, your house itself can become a source of wealth, and there are good schools and good jobs nearby. So uh, in Berkeley, we are of course <laughs> the home of single family zoning, or exclusionary zoning, or race zoning, as I call it. Which is kind of shocking for a city that's known to be so liberal. I didn't, that, that was new to me, learning from you. <laughs> right, well there's a reason why Berkeley is home of the counterculture is because they were reacting to the dominant paradigm at the time, which was hardcore elite conservatism. So the Berkeley radicals were abutting up against the power structure. And that, power, that structure still exists, as we heard earlier. Uh, they're landowners, they may be liberal in politics, but they are still the landowning elite and it's land hoarding is what we're talking about here. So when you have a time frame where you have extreme wealth inequality, and we would talk about people hoarding wealth, you think of stocks and bonds, money, but really land is wealth. And when one group of people has all the land, and you see the result, the cascading poverty throughout the state of California and the country and the world, uh, you have to address it. So in Berkeley, we're also the home of the Fair Housing Act, uh, which addressed uh, the same issues in the 60s and 70s. And so now we have this buttress to really change all the zoning and allow people to just have smaller apartments and, and duplexes and things in wealthy areas and therefore achieve, uh, hopefully, and I believe it will, uh, economic and uh, racial diversity in these high resource neighborhoods. But when you say duplexes and density and wealthy areas, they hear black people, they hear color, right? Yeah. That's code for like, oh, right? I mean, oh, yeah. right? So oh, yeah. are those wealthy areas in Berkeley gonna accept more density when they somewhere, whether they acknowledge it or not, that means scary people. Yeah, well, it's, it's look, here's, here's the thing. The, uh, <laughs> the generation below mine, the millennials, is the largest generation in human history. They dwarf the baby boomers and they're out here because the older generation above them has not expanded the portfolio of infrastructure from housing, education, healthcare. You see these student loans out of control, the healthcare, the housing, even arable land, even food. And so all across the world, you have one of crisis affordable housing in every county in the country and also around the world. And homelessness now, I was in a meeting with some Republicans in Missouri who asked me for advice about the fact they had 250 homeless encampments in their suburb of Kansas City. So it's everywhere. So this is a matter of survival of the economy. You can have that many people at the gates, but you will not stay in the castle very long. So it's a necessary function. If you want to have a holistic society with your children able to live here and your, your, your company able to have workers remain here, you have to expand the portfolio. And also there's a, another economic uh, lesson here as well. As people get older, uh, they, they, their, their physical imprint shrinks, but their house is still big. And we know that senior care is super expensive, so a better way for them is to downsize the house, keep a portion of it to live in, and make money off the rest by opening up to other people. Mm -hmm. So there's an economic incentive that I think will be persuasive in the end. So Jennifer, your, your thoughts on, on sort of the class and race part of this, because what I hear where Ben's saying a little bit is boomers didn't, haven't done so well and <laughs> what they're leaving behind. I did a whole interview once about how boomers are kind of sociopaths and, and you know, they started <laughs> off as, you know, some of the most liberal progressives in Berkeley, right? 
going to save the world, hippies, and they became the, some of the greediest people <laughs> around. So your take on that. Yeah, so I am a boomer, and uh, I'm at the bottom edge, which means we got educated about r drugs to do and not do, which was a benefit, right? <laughs> Other people learned about it. Um, <laughs> And certainly from Pittsburgh, I owe my scholarships to Harvard and Stanford uh, to those who came before in the civil rights movement and in the kind of counterculture and women's rights movements. Um, but we do get onto our own ideas with perhaps a little bit too much close-minded passion. And so one of that completely never questioned passion is building Pittsburgh. Oh my God, that's sprawl. Really? No, that's home. California, according to the Air Resources Board, development is 6% of our 100 million acre state. Other states that have any kind of normal population, Alaska would be an exception, are about 10 to 12% developed. New Jersey is 35% developed. It's everyone knows easier to build new in a way that is entirely sustainable. Net zero for greenhouse gas, the most water and energy conserving uh, uh, structures that we know how to build are the current building codes. And the idea of wedging all of those units into parking lots at Nordstrom's is absurd. It's ridiculously expensive. Too much of what Berkeley builds is gonna be $5,000 a month, one bedrooms. And there just aren't people who can afford to pay that. And those are the people who, by the way, are gonna subsidize the 20% affordable units. And so you're already stretched, and an affordable unit is given by lottery. And if you, God forbid, earn more than you're allowed to in an affordable unit, you can be evicted. That is not an upwardly mobile trajectory. And we need to just get past ourselves. We invented, who knew, the catalytic converter, which the Obama administration says got rid of 98% of tailpipe emissions. The idea that climate change means we have to reject the 7% solution, a million new acres even in California, built on existing infrastructure, designed to be sustainable, absolutely walkable, that is a conceit held here as dogma in the name of the environment, and it's another baby boomer mistake. We have to have a little more respect for things like home ownership, upward mobility, and our capacity as human beings to adapt, to actually make improvements that do feed the world and do clean up the air. But help me understand where that's gonna be, because there's something called the wildland urban interface, which is a lot of places like Paradise, California, places up against the foothills, wooded, beautiful, that with our new climate reality are fire zones. And some people say we shouldn't be building there, and even the people that shouldn't rebuild there. So if we're gonna spread out further, isn't that going right into the fire zone and danger zone when we go up against the Sierra foothills? Where is this, where is this gonna happen? So, so you skipped a few places in order to get to the Sierras. <laughs> a lot of Marin right now is being used to graze cows, which have their own greenhouse gas emission profile. Yeah. Adding 50,000 people to Marin is a heck of a lot better for the climate than grazing cows, but it's an aesthetic. Yep, that we won't yep. add people to Marin. It's a baby boomer prejudice. Well, and it's, also it's racial, not about the environment. It's also racial pre prejudice. I have a place I, in West I Marin completely and, yeah. agree with you there. I wrote a piece called Green Jim Crow about the use of environmental law to promote racism. The transit-oriented development areas, like downtown Oakland, those are the redlining maps. Redlined areas of, say, downtown Oakland are what we now call transit-oriented development, and they're hotbeds of both development and displacement. We need to get past ourselves, us boomers. Hopefully before we all die, we're starting to die already. <laughs> but <laughs> let's recognize that there are things we don't know, so and ben, we can fix it. Ben, what do you think? Would you rather have, and this is not either or binary, maybe it's and, but the trade-off between more densely uh, populated in, in, in cities like, like Berkeley or, you know, building out? Uh, it's both. I mean, we need, we need the whole portfolio. And uh, you make excellent points, too, I got to say. 
Uh, you know, so we, we, need the, we need the urban centers, of course, because that's where the, the most heightened human activity is in the world. That's where the healthiest, the wealthiest, most opportunities, it's the place. And low carbon footprint. And low carbon footprint, of course. Uh, and a place that traditionally people uh, of uh, non-majority status have done well. And then we also need to expand over, uh, elsewhere as well because, I mean, looking at the, the state of the, the state, we have more than 100,000 homeless people. Uh, we have a burgeoning workforce that is leaving the state. And we have so many people commuting so far, living in their cars, we've got to address the whole panoply. And some of the, I was listening to something the other day about how uh, Washington, Oregon, California, and Hawaii have some of the high liberal blue states, maybe it's the climate, also have some of the highest uh, percentages of, of unhoused people. Now, I'm not saying that's causation, maybe it's, cor maybe it's cor um, correlation more than causation, but what is it about these liberal states, Jennifer, that are failing? Well, I do think we have our view of our personal environment that is deserving of protection from them. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty expansive view mm -hmm. of the quote environment. Um, and uh, uh, I, hang on I think to my that, little piece of paradise. <laughs> well, and you know, I grew up in a highly polluted town. I know the environment for when it's dirty. It's no longer dirty. We like to think of it as a still catastrophic. It's no longer catastrophic. We have done a tremendous job cleaning up air and water. We have done a tremendous job preserving our best natural environments. But the idea, I'll stay with Marin because it's my favorite, <laughs> that we can't take a thousand acres of Marin and put a bunch of people who would otherwise have to live in Tracy is anti-environment. And it is not climate friendly, sorry, to put a people in a bunch of steel high rises from material imported from around the globe to build incredibly complex structures that are incredibly costly to run. We don't have a one size fits all climate solution. We can have all kinds of frankly cleaner uh, transportation solutions. We could have solved air pollution by taking cars away and saying people can only live in a one bedroom apartment. Think about that in 1970. If your parents or you were told, yeah, sorry, we're gonna take your car away and we're gonna make you live in a one bedroom apartment, so much for the three kids. I mean, there is a point at which we've taken the environment and now climate into this very myopic, very, from my perspective at least, unshared by any place in the world, except maybe some European capitals. Uh, and, and people are like, I'm not gonna be a welder or a teacher here and live in someone's backyard cottage for my whole life. Are you serious? I'm moving to Phoenix. And there's a lot of people in California who are like, great, bye. Over our holding capacity, happy to see you go. <laughs> and that anti-growth, degrowth philosophy, which is a part of the climate movement, is as racist from my perspective as the original Green Jim Crow. Mm, yeah, definitely. Degrowth is a is a thing. Uh, ben, how do you do, do you see that in terms of um, yeah, what, what what Jennifer just said? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing in point around the homelessness issue uh, in these blue cities um, and the overall wealth stratification in these same cities being so obscene, uh, I think a lot of this is human psychology at work, where you know the, that which you attack, you secretly are. So you know. Liberals like to call conservatives cruel and, and mean, when in actuality, if you look at it, they are social Darwinists. You can have a liberal person walk by someone literally dying on the street in front of them, and they're okay, they're liberal. This is freedom, right? They're not admitting it, but they're saying, mm. this person is free to live and die on their own merit right now, which is conservative. Now, another element um, is that, uh, here in California, we talk about how Ronald Reagan, uh, 50 years ago, uh, stopped funding social housing, stopped funding uh, mental health care. And that's been 50 years. And in 50 years, this state has become the wealthiest place uh, in the history of humanity. And our liberal leadership has not taken steps to correct that action from 50 years ago and still complain about it. So I think you know, a lot of these labels just aren't helpful. These are fundamental human values at play, and the fulcrum uh, is housing.
And you've talked about intergenerational warfare. I know we touched about this a little bit, but you decide describe what's happening in desirable neighborhoods as intergenerational warfare. How so? You know, there's a movie, this movie Tenet, a sci-fi film came out recently. There's a, it's a very talky movie, but there's a line in there which sticks out. Uh, it's when the main character uh, is asked, why do you think the people in the future are trying to kill us? Because they're at war with the future. Uh, and he says, well, that's how it is. It's every generation out for themselves. Hmm. So, <laughs> you know, right now we are all, um, at least my generation and below, are in a defensive trench hole position, fending off attacks from the older generation. And for instance, my old boss went to law school. Uh, I think he paid $15,000, $15, right? You wouldn't even know what my student loans are. Multiple six figures. Uh, everything that they got when the getting was good, they locked up and kept for themselves. It's almost like the, the, the 10 families that own some uh, <laughs> third world country. We're, we're replicating that. We're this 1%, as we call it, but it's really a different kind of number. Uh, it controls all the resources and makes you fight to death to get your share of it. Case in point, California is 49 out of 50 for home ownership. That's ridiculous. And at the same time, that generation is spending untold money through private equity and investment to buy up every single family house in the country. They want to make the whole population below them into subscribers and not owners. So this is economic warfare. And, and owning a house is the way that most, certainly since World War II, the biggest source of family wealth, the bi biggest way that families accumulate wealth. So you're saying that it's concentration more and more on top and we're gonna, the people are gonna be subscribers and never owners. Right, and the trends involve you know, artificial intelligence, decimating white collar work, so on, automated, automated transportation is coming as well. So the complete decimation of the transportation sector job wise. So you have this dystopian future that they're dedicated to making happen where most of us are surviving on pennies, paying rent, owning nothing, and liking it. And, and you're so, saying it's, it's been blue collar displacement, but white collar people, they're coming for you. You're not safe anymore. Right, they're not safe at all. They're done. At all. If you've used ChatGPT, you see it coming. Yeah. In the next four years, in our immediate lifetime, you will, you'll begin to see the economic system begin to unravel. So we're in it right now. And so for me, this battle is existential because you know, my family, we escaped slavery. And you know, our motto is never again. And these conditions that housing again being the fulcrum on is setting the stage for a return to servitude. And it's not acceptable, so we have to join this fight. Jennifer? Yeah, so I think that um, you've opened my eyes uh, to still more badness. Uh, <laughs> thank, but, thank you, Ben, for coming. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, while all you youngsters have been suffering out of sight um, uh, for my generation, we've been chasing gremlins. Um, uh, uh, there's a law professor who calls uh, procedural perfectionism uh, a, a new value uh, that has overwhelmed all other values. So CEQA is about, uh, the California Environmental Quality Act is about procedural perfection. Have you studied everything, including stuff we don't even know we have to study to the nth degree to the satisfaction of a 62 year old judge who majored in social studies and is a conservative white homeowner? <laughs> and if not, go back and do it again. That's what we've chased. We've chased uh, building standards in one of the most temperate climates on the globe to make our new residences tight with very highly engineered HVAC systems, uh, air conditioning and heating systems, and windows that don't open in the name of climate. Well, that's changing and, now. Um, Operable windows is a thing, right? Well, I'm just saying, <laughs> <laughs> we made it worse. We made it more expensive chasing a dream and a theory that works if you don't have to worry about how much you're spending on electricity. We had one air conditioner. When it was really hot, we piled into one bedroom and that's where we slept because that's the reality of people's lives, not the pointy headed idiocy <laughs> that we've created by our own policy choices. And I have to say for each old person who is advocating for idiocy, we have seemed to create a cone of younger people who are equally focused on 
never again building an affordable unit with a laundry room. As one of the advocates said, if each unit doesn't have its own washer dryer, I'm not building it. Well, who has a washer dryer in every apartment in California? That's ridiculous. But you wonder about your million dollar per door cost, and it's value-based decisions, standard-based decisions, and process-based over legalism that has created a policy suite in California that isn't replicated even in the rest of the country. It's choices we've made. So, and we need so to what's be the solution? Older about working together across the generational lines to break it down. So, so Jennifer, what's the solution? California. It's, it's totally simple. We need to join the rest of the of America in designing and regulating homes to four times median income. It's a magic number. If your median priced home is no more than four times your median income of households, you have a healthy housing market. And the median income d changes depending on where you are in California, but it's roughly 80 to $120,000. Californians make a lot more than the rest of the country. But we need to build policies around what we can afford, not what each special interest decides they want and has enough political clout to enforce. And you're saying that that ought to be done in greenfield land that is now grasslands or, or forest? Think and, Marin. And Marin, okay, we can think Just Marin. Just stay with Marin, yes. I'm yeah, telling you. Very... I'm not talking about sending people to paradise, which by the way is 150 years old, <laughs> and my brother lives on the ridge next door. Um, I am talking about making more efficient use of our urbanized areas, and that includes touching quote, green belts established in the 70s by voter initiatives who didn't want to look at something else on that hillside. It's really? for, for beauty and for a certain aesthetic. People are comfortable. It is. Yeah, so it's a pastoral kind of ideal of lovely golden hills and cows. And yeah, <laughs> all you young people, you can drive over the Richmond Bridge. Good luck with that. We closed <laughs> off one of those lanes for bikes. And then that is a very uh, <laughs> car centric development we heard we know that california's vehicle miles traveled is one carbon metric that's going the wrong direction most of california's climate things i'm sorry i completely disagree you're okay it's with not a carbon metric we're doing ev vehicles we went from less than five miles per gallon when i grew up to now more than 50 miles a gallon in a hybrid vehicle that can go as long a distance as a regular car and we're moving to ev vehicles transportation does not equate to terrible climate outcomes Transportation. The biggest source of greenhouse gas people? emissions in the state. Uh, it's the source of car pollution in 1970 until we invented catalytic converters, which we had no idea existed. So EVs will solve cli California's climate. They'll come a carbon. good distance along with hybrids and hydrogen and any other form of transportation. Because you know what doesn't work is putting a 70 year old who needs to go to the doctor on a bike. That doesn't work. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Uh, let's see lots of lots of gutsy uh, bikers in San Francisco with three and four year olds, which I'm I'm uh, very envious. So and the business model EV uh, drivers like myself don't pay gas tax for the road. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> As a Tesla owner, I think it's ridiculous. It's and another way we wealthier boomers who can buy Teslas and most of us are the ones who can buy Teslas as a second vehicle, upper income, that's who owns Teslas in California. Right. And we should have to pay for using the roads. Uh, now, we, do we need to track every single mile with a transponder? No, but we should have to pay a fee that corresponds to the amount of miles we're driving. And I don't know why we need transporters or transponders that track every mile and every location to do that. That's kind of stupid. Um, so again, it's kind of like taking an idea that makes sense, no gas tax, no road maintenance, no gas, we got to come up with another road maintenance solution. So let's base it on miles. Okay. I'm but now we need a transponder to track every mile you're driving. No, I'm not so there. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. so, so, so Ben, how are you doing here in between two bougie boomers, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I'm good. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it because, uh, you know, I, I've said this before at council. Uh, again, you know, and I work in innovation in my day job, uh, so I kind of have a pulse on what's coming. Uh, so the whole notion of commuting is going to be altered by 
uh, basically these robotic cars that serve mm -hmm. entire neighborhoods. They'll just be cruising all the time. You'll share a car with people, or you, you want me to drive. The cars will be electric and hydrogen. Um, Sounds like a know. dystopian hell of traffic jam. Well, that part will be fine because they'll be, they'll be in sync, right? It'll be more synchronized. Uh, and also, we'll have more local as, as building technology comes on board. And I'm happy to say that our project in Berkeley, uh, Cross River Fingers, is still coming. We, we have a supportive housing project. It's a, a public-private partnership model which has prefabricated units with a mental health supportive care on the first floor. And the vision is that this will be built in a, with a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the time. So as these new technologies around building, like new forms of concrete, new forms of scalar um, Lego block style building come together and printing, 3D printing, uh, you'll have, like what you're describing, job centers and care centers in these same little communities that are fully functional and integrated to the larger systems. And I think that's an that's a even deeper vision of resilience mm -hmm. than, what we're, than what we're imagining now. So I agree with you. So Jennifer, that potentially means, you know, there's, we have gr these grand boulevards, Geary in San Francisco, San Mateo, uh, El Camino through uh, Silicon Valley, where there's a lot of sort of maybe one, two story strip malls, small things. Th that seems to be um, crying for upzoning to have some residential on top. If we're having more, less housing in the urban core that you're talking about, and yes, we want to have some green field or grass field development. What about the areas that are already urbanized with commercial to have a little more housing there? There's already um, traffic, transit perhaps. Isn't that part of the solution? Well, it's been part of the solution and zoned as part of the solution now for more than a decade. We already have a number of streamlining laws on the books uh, that reduce some of the hurdles to getting that uh, developed. Um, there's just a, a little problem, which is the pro forma, the actual budget, because those properties, especially in a high wealth community like Silicon Valley, are earning a lot of income. And when you think about buying them, you need to buy them at a price which makes sense for the owners so the revenue stream who are going to yeah. give up that income stream. Mm -hmm. And then you have to put million dollars per apartment buildings on them and hope that you can find enough now in that case, probably $8,000 a month renters. Because we're not buying or building anything at scale at home ownership. Uh, uh, it's all rental apartments. And so the fact is, and that's before you add the 20% inclusionary for mixed income, the fact is those projects haven't penciled. If they did, they'd be being built. And uh, I don't, I mean, uh, there are, as you know, climate advocates who advocate for the end of both capitalism and democracy. And that's fine. <laughs> you go do. I've been in Berkeley with like lots of loon balls for a long time. Um, so you have fun. Talk to yourself. Uh, un until those folks run the world, and frankly, I hope they never do, uh, we just have to get a lot smarter about, wait a minute, we pulled all these policy levels and it's not, it's not working. That's because the cost of what we want is unaffordable. Our family could not have lived in Berkeley as a homeowner. We could have lived and did live in Pittsburgh as a homeowner. We could not have lived in Palo Alto as a homeowner. Do you really want to pretend that it's not going to be too expensive in some places to provide everything for anyone who comes by? That's, that's, that's juvenile. Then let's pick up on that on the questioning capitalism because I you know you know there's many types of capitalism and you seem to be questioning capitalism the kind of private equity buying up homes the kind of hyper capitalism mm -hmm. which is very different let's be honest the capitalism we have today in America is very different than the General Electric of the 1950s or even the General Electric of the Jack Welch era there's a good book out how Jack Welch broke capitalism hyper capitalism today it's you know is it serving us well. Well, it's actually like hyper-financialism. Mm -hmm. So we have here now. Uh, it's the Wall Streetification of stuff. Because, uh, you know, capitalism is neutral. It's like electricity. Right? It's a set of contracts. Yeah, it can heat your home or it can fry you an electric chair. Right? Elect electricity is power. Capitalism is a, a very efficient means of harnessing human power. And it drives innovation. It drives cooperation. Uh, it, it, it pushes excellence and increases growth. And... There's no question that American capitalism, uh, at least our American form of 
moneynomics <laughs> has led to the greatest prosperity in human history uh, for most of the world, too. And every year it gets better than the one before. So I do think, like everything else, capitalism needs to constantly be modulated and cause to challenge itself, cause to grow, because right now uh, we're so focused on uh, you know, digital advertising and all that stuff. Meanwhile, our ecosystem is on the verge of collapse. They're saying that we're going to lose half of all species in the next 40 years. So we, we need to just <laughs> uh, put some new incentives here so we can put our energies into something that will uh, cause benefit to the world. Well, it sounds like, Ben, as we get to the close here, you think that people are selfish by nature. At least systems can, can pull that part out of us. So what hope do you have for humanity? Well, look, this is, uh, you know, a, a millennia-long struggle to, to access our better halves. You know, they say the human, was it Rilke? Or Kierkegaard said human is half angel, half animal. Uh, and that's a constant battle. And it's a battle we must never back away from and keep pushing, pushing against our animal selves and increasing our angelic selves uh, and keep growing the sense of morality. And, you know, capitalism has abandoned the physical environment uh, as, a, as a piece of its goal. And so our morality, our religions, our all the functions that we use to help articulate who we are needs to now grow and include our living systems. Because without it, we're going to fall apart very shortly. So Jennifer, balancing capitalism and environment and human nature. You know, there's that whole golden rule thing. It's simple, stupid. It works for me. I think it actually works more broadly. Uh, and it has been an underpinning of American capitalism before it became Wall Streetification. I love that phrase. <laughs> Um, because the idea that you could do financial manipulations at a level that brings down the global economy by playing around with secondary mortgage markets, that's not inherent in capitalism. Mm. Cat capitalism is working hard, being able to save money, buy a house, raise your kids, and hopefully have the next generation do better than you are. And that is a value system that we, Berkeley liberals and progressives, have somehow decided to park in favor of windows that don't open <laughs> and bikes for 70 year olds <laughs> in the name of climate and the environment. And, and none of that matches. And it's, I think, just time. It's kind of like, you know, we blame Reagan 50 years ago, having not done anything in the meantime to fix it, right? <laughs> and it's a formula that works, because what, the governor blame Trump for all of the employment fraud that happened in California under COVID. Yay, you know, it blame Trump, blame Ray. That's not a solution to the fact that we can't, in this economy, seem to manage the software of a public agency to avoid sending a check to someone on death row? Are you serious? So really, let's just hold up a mirror and talk actual truth in the sense of like, there's no question we did send checks to people on death row. That was kind of embarrassing. We didn't need Trump to save us from that. Nor I think was it fair to say, yeah, Reagan, man, he really, he took it out of us. I guess we're stuck. So a little bit of return of the golden rule and frankly of civil rights. We've managed to park civil rights underneath some weird environmental justice only prioritization, which is an important part of civil rights. But what about upward mobility? What about equal opportunity? What about respect for people who didn't go to college and don't work on a keyboard that do work with their hands that we rely on every day? And we need a lot of those people to electrify things. And we need a lot of electricians in this country, that, in this state that we don't have people to work with their hands. And where are they gonna live? So it comes to housing as the fulcrum. I like that a lot. <laughs> Back to Pittsburgh and the, and the steel workers. Ben Bartlett and Jennifer Hernandez, thank you so much for joining us here on Club One. Well, let's give them a round. <laughs> um, Fun. And I'd like to give a, a shout out to Climate One and the Commonwealth Club teams for making this happen. A lot of people behind the scenes I get to sit up here in the bright lights talking to these fabulous people. But Mark, Adam, Sean, Megan, Jenny, Wensi, and Brad made it happen. Let's give them a round for making this all possible.
On Climate One today, we've been discussing housing as a climate lever with California State Senator Scott Weiner, Berkeley Vice Mayor Ben Bartlett, and Jennifer Hernandez, an environmental and land use attorney. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe in your podcast app. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. And thank you for joining us online and in the room here at the club. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Fun. Thank you.